we need to keep those, but also um, you know, involve all the challenges that working through large organizations uh, can have. So you know, politics and inscrutable decisions that are made by people in positions of authority who are self-included. <laughs> motivated by that, but again, this desire to kind of work with uh, an organization that is more nimble, have more flexibility, and so on. Um, but also um, by kind of, uh, life quality issues. So living in uh, Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, commuting to Princeton, uh, like an hour's way every day, small children, uh, you know, the school is very far away from my work. It's like the opposite side of uh, my, my house and work. So if I wanted to go to function at the kids' school, you know, the two-hour drive to get there from work is just a, not, not a good situation for me. So um, made the decision to look for opportunities, opportunities to come back here to Chicago, which is much closer to my family in the West, and also very close to my wife's family in Evanston. Uh, and uh, it turns out this sort of coincided with the growth of, of tech here in Chicago. So when I, when I graduated, there really wasn't a whole lot going on in tech in Chicago, and this is not a huge company. looking for uh, people in data science to, uh, to, um, to, to build their capacity. So they're just, um, the, the company was sort of the outgrowth of the Obama 2012 campaign ana analytics effort, and they, we have <laughs> just developed a, a data science platform that is sort of the major American cloud processing organization. So it's, a, a get, again, some continuity, but also a transition where I guess the label has changed from computational linguist Data scientist. A lot of the work is still the same, um, uh, but the, the but it also involves a lot of learning, a lot of new stuff. So it's a, it's a very different software development environment that I was in before, where you know working closely with people, collaborating on GitHub, pull requests, really expected to to, um, to deliver production software for our own embedding and not for for the big you know research research mode software development that's going on. So very soon. Um, yeah. So. Happy to answer questions about work that I've been doing uh, for different roles, but it's been a great job. Can I see my phone? Okay. <laughs> my name is Allison Klein. I did um, I did my bachelor's degree at Chris Davis at Rogers College. Uh, for any of you who don't know it, it's a very small school in southern Minnesota. I'm from Colorado. Um, I there's no connection. I just <laughs> wanted to go someplace out of state, and my mom wanted me to Midwest, so there I was. Um, I studied abroad for a year in Scotland, which at St. Andrews University, I don't know how many of you may have been there because it's very popular for international studies, but um, that was, looking back, probably my first foray into what associated business is. There are a lot of international students at St. Andrews and a lot of English as a second language international students, as well as a lot of people from other English speaking countries, the UK, Ireland, And learning to understand everyone there, getting a flexible ear for pronouncing English in different ways, I think was kind of my first personal understanding of what linguistics can be and what sociolinguistics can be, because you know, oftentimes you're saying a linguist and people say, oh, it's a foreign language, it's important. <coughs> um, so that was kind of my first experience with not just I speak five languages linguistic. Um, then not knowing what I wanted to do, like Emma, I was an English major and you can do anything when you don't really know what you want to do, that's not your shit. <laughs> so I went and taught English in Northeastern Greece for a year, which was an interesting experience of learning a language that I had no experience with, uh, even in 2004, just to see where Greece was headed. So I didn't stay, I came back to Colorado and spent a couple years as a flight attendant, you know, figuring out what I wanted to do with my life, but still having that travel bug, um, needing to stay somewhere so I could kind of root myself and figure things out. But During that time, I started honing in on linguistics as something that I wanted to do for further education and kind of plug myself back into both the career world from the academic route, as well as gaining more specific, I hope, knowledge and education to help me focus in on what I wanted to do with my life. Um, in finding the program, that was the first 
first years of the massive amendment that came into the Nursing Home Act at their time. And I was drawn to it because it was a career-focused linguistic program. Um, at the time, I had started to realize that that wasn't really a common thing, but it suited what I wanted to go to school, go back to school for. So I applied, I was accepted, and that was how I met my now wife, Cecilia. And um, I had some great professors, and mostly what I think I honed in on while I was there was discourse analysis, narrative, and identity construction. Those are the things that I'm interested in, and that I decided I wanted to use as I moved into the career road. I came to Chicago, again, sort of on a whim a bit. Uh, it was 2009, the economy was beginning to tank, and I figured this is a good job in Chicago, it's an easy reason to take a job in DC. That was my first experience with understanding how important networks are, whether you think you have them or not. And leveraging your network, talking to people, getting outside of um, not, I mean, the academic community a bit, but also just kind of getting into the working world, and just talking to people you know, because you never know where an opportunity might come up. Especially with linguists, what I found was that when you move into the career world, job titles are all over the place. There are so many things that you can do and so many different things that are placed on the title. And you were just saying, right, computational linguistics, that might be what we call it here, but outside in, in the business world, you might find a computational linguistics position, you might find a data scientist position, you might find it called something else, because depending on the company and the space you're working in, different titles have more relevance. Um, so that, I think, is one of the things that talking to people outside of academia can help you with, is just figuring out what to look for that you may, you may not know. Um, I, because the economy wasn't doing really well, I was doing a lot of administrative temping. Um, I have a lot of customer service in my background in my 20s and uh, through college and high school and stuff. And admin temping was kind of a logical progression from there, something that was easy to do and I was good at. It got to a point where I was, I felt like I was far enough away from my master's degree in time that I couldn't continue with this story I had constructed of having finished my master's degree in linguistics and computation, I'm making it here because of this. So I started honing in on the executive assistant track. Um, a lot of what I had talked to when I talked to other people that I knew about what the executive assistant does, it was something that appealed to me both because I'm organized, <laughs> I love it, um, I really like organizing things and developing systems and helping people. And that's what exactly pretty much what an executive assistant does. I found a job with the British consulate here in Chicago. Uh, no connections actually. I, it came through on a job feed that I had set up on Indeed and I went to their hosting on Career Builder where the feed had got it from, went to the British consulate's website, applied, was lucky enough to get the job. I found out later there were like 380 applicants. So I think in that sense I was very lucky very lucky, um, had a recruiter friend get a really good job prepping me for the interview, so for looking at careers, um, seemed to find just somebody who's been to interviews before, somebody who knows a bit about the interview structure, and, and go through it. I think the packet examples are a huge thing, just to have answers at the ready, so you don't, so you sound good, you come across presentable, or not presentable, but um, finished, polished in the interview, you know what you're talking about, you're confident, I think those things are really great. And I had, so I got the job. Working through that, I think, was very interesting from a linguistics perspective because our office was about half Brits, half Americans, and all the Brits who were there had been living in the U.S. for you know five years or more, except for the diplomats. The consul general is a deputy consul general. They were diplomats by you know three to five year cycle, kind of moving through in their job, um, and so it kind of plugged me back in with a lot of you know Britishism versus Americanisms. I'm sure you've all read about them. There's definitely a folk linguistic. It, working with people like this kind of day in, day out, it gets deeper. Like there's there's more than just terminology and, and syntax sometimes. It gets into frames. Um, the employee review process is something that I discovered has a certain framework that the way the Brits do it that I think may not be the same with a lot of American companies. Um, I did a lot of event management, so I spent a lot of time just talking to people, chatting with people, networking in my capacity of managing events. You know, I was around all the time making sure the catering's good, making sure people are taken care of, making sure the door is staffed, like there wasn't any tags, there's definitely not a food or drink, and <laughs> making sure that that's all taken care of. You talk to a lot of people. Um, 
because you get a lot of experience. You know, other people's career paths have been like, what other people think about linguistics, and getting the word out there that linguists don't just study um, other languages, that what we study can be useful in many contexts. And so that's part of the highlight of that is spreading the word a bit. Um, recently, I left the CrossFit. I got a job at Axel Nobel. You may not know who they are because they do specialty um. chemicals, specialty paints, and specialty coatings. So unless you're working in those areas, you probably wouldn't have heard of them, but they are definitely one of the top, top five, if not top one company in what they do worldwide. They're based out of the Netherlands. Um, they do paints for Formula One cars because they need to have special um, chemical properties in order to withstand what you put those cars through and what's going on in the weather. They do uh, chemicals for shampoos, different kinds of body care and stuff. So the brands that you use are like So it's, it's kind of a weird company to work for because nobody knows what they do, but they're everywhere. Um, it's interesting from a communications perspective. That's part of my title. So I do admin support, which is how I got into it because I do manage budget systems. Um, and they kind of threw this communications thing in there when they were pitching the job to me and said that, you know, there's, there's definitely like something you're interested in, which I had expressed to the agency. They said there's career potentials to kind of move through in a communications function in the company. I've only been there since April discovering that a company doesn't do communications at all on any level, whether it's a business level, just people talking to each other, or a linguistics level, uh, you know, in, uh, internal communications, sending the message from corporate down to all of the people who are working at the bottom. So it's been really fascinating so far from that perspective. Right now, something I'm doing, I developed a communication strategy for the business I work in, uh, just a quick thing. So there's those three business areas I mentioned. Under those business areas, they have business under a business unit, you have business as, this is their terminology, they call it, um, business unit is pretty industry standard. You call everyone below that a business, I don't know if that's an industry standard or just an Axel Nobel thing. Um, so I developed a communication strategy for the business I work in, and we're starting to implement that a little bit. It's a new business, so I think they kind of feel like they don't have an identity per se. They do some very disparate chemicals, so it doesn't necessarily tie together instinctively. We're working on bringing everybody together under that business, feeling like they belong to something, and making sure that communication is flowing from the top to the bottom and back. So that's something I'm working on right now. I'm also, uh, you will find communications means something different in every business. There, there's a core understanding of like communications, that they're talking to each other, but every business kind of lumps different things into that, whether you're working on external communications or internal communications, whether you're working on branding or whether So um, <coughs> there's a technical component to that where I'm learning SharePoint again. That was an experience with it about five years ago. And developing that so that it's useful for the end user and for us in executing our communication strategy. So that's kind of some stuff I'm doing now, kind of my career path. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Yeah.
just moving on to the fact that he was getting lots of things set. So I did a couple of years off and was able to do the United Nations, um, traveling around Massachusetts and New York City and Guyana, and of course New York City. And then I applied to graduate school and came to University of Chicago to do full-time PhD. Um, I applied here specifically because I was interested in thinking in STEM fields, um, and then I ended up being the field that I stayed in. I uh, finished my coursework focused on um, physics and maths. Um, I initially figured I was going to just stay in general physics, but somehow, some way, some maths kind of became more of a focus. And I did my master's degree in those disciplines and are here in these programs still now. Um, after spending some time previously working in Stern Labs, doing my stuff now. And graduated in December of 2011, so not all that long ago. Um, of course, while I was in graduate school, I helped Organizing data and helping to build the models. Um, and my 
Linguistics was something I, I became interested in sort of for a specific purpose at, during my grad school, junior year during graduate school, and then actually doing linguistics and learning linguistics and how to get the research and look at it and stuff. I became so passionate about it. I, I, you know, I love social linguistics. It's so, I mean, it's every day. It's just our conversations that you have where you're thinking linguistics and you're analyzing stuff subconsciously or consciously, <laughs> just not out loud all the time. Um, and so for me, that's always, in every transition, you know, other things may have worked transitions, but I'm always thinking about sort of how I can maintain a, a linguistic experience in wherever I'm going sometimes. And so like when I was working with the executive assistant track, it was something where I saw that role working with every team in the office or in the organization, right? When you're, when you're paired with an executive, that person is working with everyone in the office. And as such, my role would be critical to understanding what people are saying, helping them maybe pitch it to the executive, because you become this, this trusted aid where people know that you're sort of inside the head of wherever yeah. the executive is, that we had constant general change while I was there. And the team sort of understood that I was gonna know this new person mm -hmm. better, quicker, so immediately I became that, I mean you said translator, but that's not really it, just sort of that aid for understanding between how they can convey their priorities to this executive and how I can convey the executive's priorities to the team. And so I think that was something that as a linguist, just sort of in a sense being able to understand people's different ways of saying the same thing um, and being sensitive to that, that was something that kind of came into daily life, and I saw people recognizing that even if they couldn't articulate it. Um, and then my position now is just a little more direct because they're like, oh, you communication, you could do that, right? <laughs> so now it's more something that I'm doing internally and in how can we do communications better. But um, yeah, I think linguistics and what I've learned and ways of thinking, like you said earlier, when I was getting prioritized when I was doing linguistics, just as being kind of positively out of problem. anymore to, to pass you know in professional careers you're past the point but maybe in like law I guess or accounts you know where you just learn your craft and then you apply it the next 50 years of your career you know you're constantly sort of expected to stay up to speed on what's going on in the world and, um, and, and be thinking about how to transition to the next thing uh, and it's hard that can be a bad thing because you're exhausted and you're yeah. constantly <laughs> keep up on what's going on and you know think about how you're going to keep doing what you're doing and move to something else but it's also kind of a good thing when you're thinking about a transition you're not alone. Like people, mm -hmm. the people who have established positions are thinking, you know, they need to move into the next step. They need to figure out what the new technology is, what the new business people are using. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a very good learning experience. I guess if you're just starting out, you try to apply <laughs> like the, the turbulence is perfectly natural and it's actually good because you're just like picking things and it, it teaches you a little bit more and you just you know how to use them and in the space that you're going to be been a year and a half in Chicago before I landed at Consular. And when I finished at Georgetown, because of my interest in narrative and identity theory, what I wanted to do was branding. I wanted to do branding or marketing communications. Um, those are both areas that companies stop spending money on when they don't have money. You know, they, they just try and kind of maintain 
that's how they can fix things and how they can start an off year plan. So in a down economy, that's a difficult area in the first place. Add to that that I don't have a marketing degree. I don't have a branding degree. I didn't have any experience in it. No matter how much I could, and, and trust me, Anna was great working on my elevator pitch and how I know identity theory, how I worked on analyzing narratives to see how they match with your you know, target demographics. No matter how much I talked the talk in cover letters, nobody would, either people were reading them or people didn't care. And there was a professor that I had at Georgetown, um, I took a linguistic anthropology class from, and he's, he's no longer at Georgetown, he's moved on, but um, I was back for GERT, the Georgetown University Roundtable, and about, let's see, that's in March, so almost a year after I'd been in Chicago, and, and he was just kind of, we were catching up in the margins, and he said, so how are things going? And I said, I'm still looking for work. And he said, I expect to be so derailed, Allison. And it was this moment I had where I was like, I just wanted to grab him and say, yes, yes. Everyone I talked to was like, you know, you're educated, you're smart, you're gonna find something, it's gonna be okay, you know, have you tried, you know, everyone's got suggestions, everyone's very helpful or they want to be helpful. But no, that was the first time anybody had acknowledged that I had a really terrible, terrible experience of trying to find what you want and being forced by what I consider external forces to reposition yourself, to find a new narrative, to find something else that you're interested in. And, um, and, and finding the executive assistant track at first was, was still sort of demoralizing because I had sort of a stereotypical view of what an executive assistant does. Um, but in, in rewriting the narrative of what I wanted to do with that kind of career path and what I wanted to do in that kind of position, and then finding the consulate, having the opportunity to do that, and using the, the network I developed at the consulate, and that was really a, a great opportunity. Um, in hindsight, I can say it worked out the best. And you're right, it, it's horrible in hindsight. It's like, oh, that sounds really natural. Sounds like you just found this thing and you knew that person, and oh, that's great. How do I get that? And, and the horrible thing is that you can't. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it is just a, a chance. You know, it happens when it happens. And you do what you can and you prepare and you're ready for opportunities, but sometimes you can't see it coming. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. It is. But it's, it's well, very more and motivating. If I can even say that, I mean, I think that mirrors like the, the parallel to a lot of maybe for me coming from my career today, I had the same goal as Linda of trying to get the two thousand dollars and I'm sitting here thinking that and I, I, I never really examined that that this was what was going to happen. And um, I was still graduating actually not too yeah. long time after this one from where you graduated and you know that, that academic development that is is not as central to academic identity, but it's certainly a bond student. And um, I think I, I have never never a question or I never even knew whether I wanted if that's really what I wanted it was very natural so I, I applied and I was a finalist for for a few different positions and I applied probably ended up all told with a dozens <laughs> dozens and dozens and rounds of 100 of applications and and I was thankful and then at the end of it all realized that needed more diversity and more hands-on application was the most clear to me that that wasn't something that I was coming from and would have fully understand and so it ended up with a blank slate. So <laughs> yeah and one other thing I say I think yeah there is some selection bias here you're going to be people who <laughs> 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 Decisions you've made, um, but um, you know I know other folks in my cohorts and readers at JSA, like the people who are uh, maybe least satisfied with the companies that you had are pro probably uh, not the ones who have you know consciously made the most transitions. I think the the risk of actually making a change is much lower than people think. It could it, it could not turn out well, and then you just quit and do something else. But the I think you tend to uh, overestimate. The value of staying with the status quo and, and just really being able to crack into a position that will not